am EdCast Chief Learning Strategist. Um, I, my, my background though is about 20 years in L&D in blue chip companies uh, like Bosch Automotive, Alstom, or uh, General Electric. Um, but my most recent post before joining the vendor side uh, was as chief learning uh, officer at Danon, the little yogurt company, about 100,000 people. And it's with this collective experience that I'm going to be sharing to you uh, today my opinion on how to build a future ready L&D organization. Um, and so I want to start really today um, talking about how this is really a, a unique moment in history and seeing this picture, I don't think I need to explain more after uh, the year or more than a year that we've just lived. But one thing is for sure about this, about the, the pandemic and what we're going through, is that we're probably not going back to that new, that, that normal, right? Everybody is talking about the new normal and saying, what does that actually mean? Um, but because we see that society is really changing and adapting to this digital world. I really like this image uh, that I saw on, um, on um, the BBC. I, I would love to have that role. I don't know what an emoji translator is, um, but it does sound uh, very interesting as, as a new, new uh, career choice, right? Um, but not only roles are changing, policies, governmental policies are changing. Here we uh, see an article about Deutsche Bank saying, um, why don't we have a 5% tax for people who are working from home that stays working from home after the pandemic? And I know that seems a little counterintuitive, uh, but the reason, the justification of this tax is saying, hey, when people go out and they go out into the workplace, they're actually spending money in local um, commerce and they're not going to be doing that anymore. So how do we make sure that those local commerces thrive? And one way of saying it is, well, those people who are not coming in, let's give them an additional tax. Now, whatever you think about that um, uh, is, uh, you can not like the idea, but my point being that the policies are, are really, we're really thinking about how this adaptation should be in society. But not only society is thinking about the ways they're adapting, what, what we're seeing is that companies are still also adapting um, and moving faster uh, than maybe they're, what they're comfortable with. Um, this is a McKinsey study done last summer. Uh, so right in the middle of the pandemic and what they were seeing looking at global 2000 companies is they're seeing the acceleration or that pace of change increasing uh, and saying it was already increasing with all of the topics around digital transformation. Uh, but last year has actually caused an acceleration of things that were happening maybe annually or quarterly to be moving at monthly or weekly. So all of that uh, kind of activity that can happen within a company, including dedicating time uh, to digital kind of solutions. What we're seeing is that acceleration or the pace uh, picking up. But with that, uh, we also see that some of the industries that you might be in, or maybe all of the industries are being impacted. Here's an example of one very in uh, interesting industry that's been impacted is really the performance industry. Um, and what we see is that actors who are no longer uh, doing theater, uh, doing plays in theaters or making movies or, or, or being able to make the things where people can gather, um, well, they've gone to Cameo. And if you don't know Cameo, it's extremely interesting. It's, it's how actors have been revising their relationship with their fan base. Instead of being able to go into movie theaters and creating those things, um, what they do is they record uh, videos or short videos that they actually sell to others. 
And the most interesting thing about it is the most famous actors in the world are not the biggest earners on Cameo. The biggest earner on Cameo is actually an actor um, from the, actually uh, not a very well-known actor from The Office uh, that has uh, the biggest earner for last year because he was making messages out to colleagues. So very interesting and in how uh, we have to revise that relationship that we have um, in, in terms of our stakeholders. Um, and then what is the most important around this transformation is to know that people are at the heart of that transformation. And this example on uh, telehealth, uh, what we saw is for years and years, they were saying, no, we can't do doctors, nurses, and everybody in the healthcare industry was saying, no, uh, doing telehealth is something that uh, we can't do because we want those patients to come inside and we need to see them face to face. And what happened is nearly overnight last year, um, the entire healthcare industry decided that maybe telehealth was something that could be done. And it was the people who realized as we have no choice, we're going to transform. And it's the people who help that transformation. And that could not happen if in the minds of the people being transformed, they didn't believe that it could happen. And COVID did show us that. So with every, with transformation being a real everyday reality, um, what is the, reskilling is really the biggest opportunity and the biggest challenge that you might have. So the big question really is, is your L&D team ready? And so what, the way we're looking at this is the new normal is going to be remote first. Um, we're looking at the world is changing, as I just I I explained. Um, people are interacting differently. And I guess I don't need to explain a lot about that either. Uh, but we are interacting more remotely and more virtually. Uh, but the workforce is also changing. There's new generations now, five generations of, of workforce um, in, in, in a single office. And HR really needs to look at that and the nature of the work is changing. Not only what we're doing, but the speed. Remember that pace of change is also increasing. And with that, CLOs are really asking themselves, um, this is what's keeping them up at night, right? It's how can I support the business um, in that accelerating digital transformation or uh, people transformation that my CEO is going through? Um, the second question that they may ask is what can I do to ensure that I have that right skills at the right time to stay competitive, right? Um, how do I make sure that reskilling happens? And one of the most important questions that they're asking is, is my team is supposed to lead that transformation. Um, are they skilled and ready? And so those questions are really, really important uh, for us to ask. But before I move into the solutioning part, I want to talk a little bit about a, a, a study uh, that EdCast conducted last year, and we conduct it every year, uh, by the way, called the Learning Health Index. And this Learning Health Index really helps you, um, a, an organization, to determine or um, assess the um, uh, the health of your learning organization. And that is on eight different dimensions. Um, but a little bit of what I found interesting of uh, the results of this study is that we see that companies today, um, they're not leveraging the right technologies to, to facilitate learning. And 75% of the respondents agreed with that. Um, but also 70% of the companies that we um, surveyed are actually not uh, leveraging the right metrics or the right data for business impact. Now, that doesn't mean that they're not measuring, but they're maybe not uh, leveraging that if they are measuring it. And then finally, we're looking at 44% uh, of organizations say they're L&D uh, professionals. They don't have that necessary skill set to be future facing and future ready. So based on those, those areas, I thought it would be interesting to give five tips around where I thought uh, we, uh, the, your organization could be helped through those leveraging um, those different elements where your organization may not be ailing, but may be developing right now. And the first one really is around developing a robust engagement strategy. 
Now, notice I didn't say learning strategy. It's really around an engagement strategy because it could, it needs to take one step up and look at engagement and employee experience in a different way. And here, what we see, is the, the information is two years old, but it's still extremely relevant today. And what we see is Gartner is talking about how um, this is the focus points of CLOs and CHROs um, in, in today's modern forward-facing world, which means that we have to have a, a, a holistic approach to not only how we retain talent, how we measure talent, um, how performance is linked, but also how engagement in, is linked. And so having that holistic uh, engagement strategy is really the key to starting a, a, a future-ready uh, type of or L&D organization. And the skills on the team that you need uh, for this is people who are very familiar with employee experience design. So this is generally taking from your talent organization. But equally important in engagement strategies is around digital marketing. Uh, are there people on your team that understand what digital marketing is and how to reach and target those people who are interested in particular topics or that you need to start a conversation conversation with. And if you don't know uh, about growth hacking, I've been particularly interested in growth hacking in the last five years because it is a new uh, type of, 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 of role that focuses on the psychological aspects as well as the data-driven aspects of, in, uh, of marketing. And so what it does is growth, uh, growth hackers are really tapped in to understanding the mind of the consumer, the mind of the employee and can really drive engagement strategies are very targeted uh, to, um, to a particular message that you would like to send. So having growth hackers on your team might not be a bad idea. The second element around building an, an L&D organization that is uh, agile and future ready is really around how you design your learning content and how you look at the, your learning strategy. And before we used to talk a lot about make or buy, but I want to add two elements um, to that. Um, I'm not going to talk too much about make or buy because you probably know about that. Um, the two things that are slightly different between uh, the make or buy that you might know of yesterday compared to the one you might look at in the future is really around how we buy, um, how we buy that off the shelf content. Um, a lot of vendors today are looking at an all or nothing type of catalog. Let me buy the catalog and I have to buy the entire thing or I can buy bundles. Um, but what about a pay-per-use model, just like on cable TV when you want to watch that particular boxing uh, match, but you don't want to watch, uh, you, you might not want to buy a season pass for boxing. Um, it's the same way, pay-per-use, you might want to just buy a single course content. So looking for technologies and vendors that kind of open up to a different way of buying might be uh, very interesting uh, for your organization. Um, but what is also interesting is around Git and Curate, and they're very linked. Git is around thinking that there is the wide world of the internet out there, and there's tons of learning content. Um, so how would you leverage that learning content without sending your people off uh, to Google and to get distracted by everything that you can find in Google? How can you leverage the power of all that interesting learning content and purify it? Um, um, so invest in technologies that um, that will complement kind of that premium content that you're buying. Um, and make sure that you're leveraging that um, free content. And how do you leverage it? Well, uh, that's about curation. Uh, what we say at EdCast is content is king, but context is his queen. And that means that we like to surround or we like to create those playlists or what we call pathways into something that's a little bit more engaging. So when you're looking at that, um, uh, that MOOC or that longer deep skilling course, that you do have courses that are micro-learning occasions 
conversations around that to set the scene or set the context of what you're learning. So having technology that can allow you to do pay-per-views, um, allow you to you know, get that free content from the, the, the internet without uh, without uh, being distracted and and being able to collect that into a type of playlist um, is very important in terms of, of, of a more agile um, 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 portfolio strategy. And what the skills on, that you would need on your team to kind of make this happen is really around agile design or design thinking um, so we could make or buy just a little differently. Um, people who know about curation strategies, and that would be a, a very, very good skill to have or to teach. And then finally, because a lot of this is in the way you relate to vendors, um, uh, uh, having skills around vendor management is, and especially technology vendor management is so important now more than ever, uh, very important. Just doing a quick time check. Looks like I'm okay. Uh, so the third point around this is really around focusing your team on the five moments of need. And this is the five moments of need in the employee experience. I don't want you confusing this with the five moments of need in learning, uh, which are slightly different. There are some uh, aspects that stay the same, but this is around the talent life cycle. So what we're looking at here is when you're new or onboarding, there's a real focus Focus that L and D uh, departments. This is a real opportunity to um, to introduce the L and D um, um, organization to new hires, right, and to get them used to having that dialogue with L and D. The second point around going deeper or wider within a certain um, field. A lot of us sit up today and worry and concerned. Is our is the role that I'm in actually evolving to a point where I find my skills irrelevant? So um, making sure that you're looking at um, anticipating those future skills um, are, are, are something that is, is extremely important to that moment of need and making sure that you know how to fill um, those, those moments of reskilling or upskilling. Uh, but but equally important and some would argue even more important is how do we support the employee or the knowledge worker in um, their daily activity or their daily performance? And I'm a big believer in focusing more on performance than focusing on learning uh, for learning sake. So when we're looking at this, uh, do you have technologies or do you understand how you can help um, that most moment of need of learning on the job or in the flow of work. Of course, I've talked a lot about in the beginning around change management or uh, the transformation that's going on. And so transformation is a huge moment of need uh, for employees because they need uh, orientation around that change that they're living. And so being a partner at that stage is really important. And then finally, because today's world and today's employees, that modern knowledge worker is not looking uh, for just visibility within a role but within a career, um, helping your organization to retain that talent by giving them visibility and helping them to upskill so they can move to a new role is something extremely valuable in terms of the L&D experience. And so the skills that you would need around that is really around Talent management, of course, because these are typically talent life cycles, um, but understanding performance and how that affects the value on business, that's really important. So having people who have dealt more in performance or task-driven or, um, or uh, goal-driven or action-driven types of activities within the organization is really important. And also, finally, um, because there's a lot of transformation in what we're looking at, pulling people in from your OD division or your transformation organization is something that seems um, that, that could add a boost to the knowledge on your typical L&D um, team. 
Moving on to the tech stack. This is one of my favorite topics uh, because I love talking about technology and how that relates to everything I just said. So, um, you know, we're talking about getting and settling your strategy, looking at your portfolio strategy, and then looking a little bit about when. Now, let's talk about the actual um, the, 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 the technology ecosystem that seems really relevant for that kind of modern learner, that modern knowledge worker. The elements that you see here are probably um, obviously non exhaustive, but I picked out eight of the most important. Um, owning the platform or feeling like you own the platform is something really important to a lot of users um, because we're taking that from our own daily experience. We, are, we as employees are also consumers in our private lives and being consumers, we're exposed to all of this new technology and new apps um, that they have uh, designed just for us. And when you're thinking about social media and you're looking at Facebook or Instagram or Snapchat or WeChat, uh, what you're seeing is these con consumer grade features allow us to feel like there's some personalization on that platform. So uh, point four that I'm, uh, that I'm talking about right now, that feeling of personalization or individualization. And that is that same feeling that you really want from your learners to, to be able to flip your learning culture and drive a more self-driven or a continuous learning culture within your organization. But again, as I've said before, we're not looking at learning in a bubble. We're looking at as a lifelong or a career-driven development. So having a tech stack that looks at careers uh, across uh, the board in terms of mobility is something that's extremely important and that is now embedded within that uh, learning experience that we call actually the talent experience. Relevant content or, you know, the uh, learners are extremely busy today. And so we've got to remember that we, they have very little time uh, for uh, and attention to give to their upskilling. So um, having some AI or machine learning driven recommendations, just like you might get recommendations in, ed, uh, in, in Netflix or Spotify, um, pushing those recommendations is going to help respect the time of the learner and respect uh, the needs of the learner. Jumping down to number five, looking at learning in the flow of work. I talked a little bit about this in my five moments of need, but making sure that your tech stack is actually doing uh, a support, uh, performance support is really important. That means that maybe we can imagine a world one day where there won't be a learning platform, that all of the learning might happen in the different areas and the systems of work and on the job only. Um, so just like in Silicon Valley, they're kind of going no UX. Um, they're moving to Siri, Alexa, and having actually no, no UX or no platform to look at. Um, it, learning in the flow of work imagines what that might be in the learning sphere. No learning platform in the future. That's very, very uh, uh, um, provocative right now, but I, I'd, like to, I'd love to know what you think about that. Um, Having a platform also that's really engaged towards um, digital marketing to uh, allow you to have nudges, triggers, and to have outreach to your audience and understanding the metrics around that um, is very, very important. So um, um, having that, making sure that a, a part of your ecosystem is a marketing tool for targeting is really important. And point seven around personalized learning insights, just like my Apple Watch, when I use it and it tells me, just gives me insights about how I move, it actually teaches me to move better. Learning insights does the exact same thing for your learner. When we give you insights on how you learn, when you learn, what you learn, in fact, that helps you to learn better because it's teaching you and that concept of learning how to learn. Right. And that is actually the new role of LD is we are facilitators of learning and not the givers of learning.
And then finally, I'm a big believer in so, uh, collective intelligence and social learning. That's a really important, important point here around building communities and building um, those silos of, or, or those groups of people who can uh, learn and share off of each other for that tacit learning within your organization to really thrive is, is an important future um, element that you'd have to have. And um, of course, the skills that you might need to support all of this strategy is around making sure that you're, uh, that you're really partnering either with your HRIS or that you have people on your team that's really plugged into HR systems and HR ecosystems. Um, of course, all members today of your team should be digitally fluent, and then all members should have a really firm grasp, not only on data and reporting. I'm not talking about reporting here. I'm talking about analytics and the decision making analytics that can help predict future activities. For example, are you looking at your content strategy and how your content gets traction so you can predict what kind of content in the future would be uh, would have the most engagement? Those are the types of analytic skills that I'm, I'm talking about. Quick. Uh, time check here. Uh, last slide uh, before we go to questions, if we have time for those. Um, these are the new roles within L&D organization. Now, they can be called other things, but I want to just hit on a few of these in terms of performance consultants. Of course, they come in and they ask your business, hey, um, they're, they're not saying what should, what kind of training program do you need today? They're saying, what KPI do you need us to change? And let's start from there. So trying to get to that kind of ROI and Kirkpatrick's level is really easy when you start with that question. What KPI do you want me to change? And let's focus on that. And maybe the solution around that is not processes. I mean, it's not training, but it's processes, tools, or people. Um, and it's not a knowledge gap. So looking at performance consultants in part, as a part of your team is going to really help you bring you to that next level. Experience engineers look at it a little bit more holistically. They're not looking at it as I'm designing like instructional designs, look at the, the program design. Experience engineers look at end to end that, in, that learning experience and design something across the board uh, from, uh, from hire to retire, right? It's more holistic. Um, marketing analyst, I've said a lot about marketing, so this is why we would need a marketing analyst on the team to understand that digital marketing areas um, and, and to understand how you can engage with your, your employees. Um, Curators and influencers. I've talked a little bit about in, uh, curators, but influencers are those, those people who might be subject matter experts or not, um, but they have a voice and they know how to reach uh, the employees. Now, whether that's voices digital or in person, these are the people that other people look up to. And you have to think of ways of leveraging that to work with your L&D organization. And finally, uh, influencers would be nothing without community managers uh, looking at how you can really drive in social learning and use those community managers to drive engagement on a technology platform is something that is going to be a vital skill and a vital role in the future embedded within your L&D organization and not just a part of your uh, communication uh, division. So I'm going to just end with one message here is I believe that the only way to win in this competitive world is to learn faster than anyone else. And that comes from Eric Rice, the, 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 the author of The Lean Startup. Um, and I live by this rule because I really do think that learning faster is uh, the way to be a successful, future-ready, uh, agile organization. Thank you so much. Thank you, Annie. Uh, all right, we have some time for Q&A session. Uh, we have a question here from Jasmine. Uh, Jasmine would like to, uh, your thoughts on how do you think uh, organizations can actually kickstart a learning community? For example, a community of practice or interest in a large size workplace. Do you have any enablers to highlight any insights to share? Oh, yeah. Oh, I love that question. Uh, because people start to um, uh, think of it this way. When you're on Facebook, um, how often would you go back to Facebook if Facebook told you what group that you had to belong to, what group you had to start, um, and then made you follow all of these people 
uh, within your organization uh, with, I mean, these random people that they think that you're going to like, right? You, you'd probably go once to see, and if it didn't fit you, you wouldn't come back, right? So uh, building communities in Facebook is sort of how we should look at building communities in organizations, but we don't. What we do is we go to the leaders and we ask the leaders, do you want to build a community, a community of practice? Um, a better way of starting is allowing the democratization and allowing communities to organically start and just uh, uh, just like learning how to learn, that's our new role in L&D. Um, how about we teach people, create a group called become an influencer, become a group, a community manager, and just to teach them the basic principles of starting communities. And you allow your, your, um, your workforce to actually create the groups they want to create. And when you see that they're getting traction, then you come in and give them that second level of support of saying, how about we bring in a community manager now that this influencer has created that. Um, and so that organic creation and listening to them is going to be much more impactful than trying to structure and trying to estimate how, what communities do we start with? Um, that would be my recommendation is democratize that process and allow them to tell you where to start. I hope that that's answered your question. Thanks, Annie. Uh, we have another question here. Um, in terms of what, if the company you're talking about isn't equipped with the right technology, so as the L&D professional, what can we do to actually cultivate a culture of you know, learning fast and applying what we learn as quickly as well? Absolutely. And that, you know, um, so I, so remember, I'm a little biased on, on the technology here. I, uh, I'm uh, the reason why I work at EdCast today is because I discovered EdCast when I was the CLO of Dannon. And we were looking at a way of driving a, a philosophy that we called one learning a day. And one learning a day was saying, hey, actually, all of us learn one, you know, every day. And so if we can think of saying that phrase, when we actually learn something that's driving a culture and an awareness of learning without throughout the organization, right? But um, uh, first, to, to have that, that, that engagement strategy of we have this ambition of one learning a day, we want to make sure that everybody realizes that they're, that they're receiving that learning and be thankful for, for learning something today. Um, we want to accompany that strategy with technology. So I spent, and don't be afraid of this, but I spent nine months within the organization of talking to key people, explaining to them how one learning day can be enabled through technology. And so I, I, I spent that time to buy in the organization and to drive the vision before I actually started on that uh, technology expenditure. And the second thing I did was make sure that I'm getting those little quick wins. Is there a, something that I can invest in very quickly um, and, and not have a lot of overhead to kind of show gradually how that kind of culture could work uh, within the organization, that's, that's also important. So driving that vision and not, not trying to invest in the technology before you've anchored the vision and also um, making sure that you have some of the, 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 those quick wins to prove the point around uh, future, you know, the, the, those, those types of kind of revolution thoughts that you might have um, show quick examples of that and people will be um, lining up and knocking at your door asking you when are you going to get that platform in place instead of you pushing them saying oh we re really need to buy it thank you very much Annie unfortunately we run out of time so once again thank you very much for joining us today for our audience uh, please to continue to join us uh, we still have a lineup of very exciting technology presentations today throughout until 3.45. So please join us for that. And once more on behalf of everyone, thank you very much, Annie, and I hope to see you again soon. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Bye-bye.